Ladies and gentlemen, families, and fellow veterans, we are gathered here as one to honor and pay tribute to the brave men and women who fought and made the ultimate sacrifice. This burden we carry comes with the understanding that the destiny of self-government and the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty is staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people, and that this liberty we love so much ultimately belongs to those who are willing to sacrifice for it. Therefore, we come together by speaking their names, reaccounting their acts of valor, and their unwavering dedication to protecting our cherished values of liberty and democracy. By suspending the other imperatives of life for a few minutes of ritual and reflection, our acts convey a sort of immortality upon these heroes, who continue to live as long as they are remembered. I must warn you, there is a cost to the words I am about to bestow on you. They are heavy. They are first-hand accounts of actions of bravery from a war and what often felt like a world away. I can assure you these accounts were heavy to remember, heavier to write down, but still are the heaviest to speak. Many of us who remember September 11, 2001, know why we had to fight this war in Iraq because our own innocent men, women, and children were targeted and used against their will and forced to die on American soil. You didn't have to read it in the papers or hear it in the fear of the voices of the survivors on the news to know it was wrong. I was sitting in a communications class during basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, when everything unfolded. A drill sergeant came into the room told us that a plane had hit one of the World Trade Center buildings and allowed anyone with family in New York to call home immediately. Moments later, the drill sergeant came in again and told us a second plane had hit the other tower, both jetliners. He would let us know if there was more information. For an hour and a half, we sat there in that classroom trying to pay attention, others connecting the dots in their mind, worrying about family back home, all the while, war was being declared above our heads. I remember the drill sergeant walking in the room for a third time, somberly placing his feet into the position. Reaching up behind his head, he slowly took off his campaign hat and placed his hands on opposite sides of his broad felt brim as he held it out in front of his chest. As his voice carried the worst news he's ever had to deliver to a group of individuals that it mattered to the most. After completing his mission, as he turned to walk away, he said three words I'll never forget. Pray for war. It wasn't until December 14, 2001, that I saw the first pictures and the terror that took place that day. I can assure you, after months of isolation and preparation, my convictions were as strong as those that survived the attacks. I prayed for war. Alabama, like many other states, suffered the loss of its sons and daughters individuals who embodied the spirits and values of their communities. Alabama lost four of her own when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon, taking the lives of Army Sergeant Tamara Thurman from Bruton, Alabama, Army Major Dwayne Williams from Jacksonville, Navy Operations Specialist Second Class Nahaman Lyons from Mobile, and Civilian Information Technician Marsha Ratford from Pritchard, Alabama. Leading up to the war in Iraq, Alabama suffered the loss of another son when Johnny Michael Spann, an Auburn alumni and CIA agent, was killed at the Khalid Jangi Fortress in Afghanistan during an Al-Qaeda prisoner uprising on November 25, 2001. Mike Spann was from Winfield, Alabama. He was the very first American casualty in the global war on terror following the terror attacks on 9-11. Opelika suffered the loss of three of its sons to the global war on terror. On April 4, 2004, Stephen Dusty Hiller was killed when his convoy was attacked in Sadr City. He was part of the rescue mission, going in to save the lives of 18 soldiers and an interpreter who had been ambushed and taken casualties earlier that day. On July 24, 2005, Army Sergeant Christopher Taylor was killed during a mortar attack in Balad, Iraq. He was a proud graduate of Opelika High School. On October 29, 2009, Army Specialist Adrian Avila succumbed to his injuries sustained in a non-combat-related accident at Camp Boo Ring, Kuwait. 
As a state, we would suffer the loss of 140 service members to the global war on terror. 93 of these brave souls lost their lives fighting for the liberation and freedom of the Iraqi people. We remember them today, forever etching their names in our collective memory. In the deserts of Iraq, these men and women faced harsh conditions, enduring scorching heat, dust storms, and the constant threat of enemy fire. They found themselves in places like Baghdad, Fallujah, Mosul, Sadr City, and Tikrit. In these cities, they confronted the harsh realities of war where every street corner held the potential for danger. They carried the weight of heavy gear and weapons, never faltering in their determination, moving forward step by step, knowing that their actions would shape the course of history. At the beginning of the war, history was all around us. It felt as though you could just reach out and touch it. When the Iraq war started on March 19, 2003, I was driving the first military police vehicle to cross the border into Iraq, which was the Army's new Armored Security Vehicle, or ASV. In 2010, the U.S. Army began collecting stories and accounts from the start of the war. The United States Army Military Police Corps took special interest in our unit, the 527th Military Police Company. In an effort to recover military history used on the battlefield in Iraq, the Army ordered an extensive search and requested that our vehicle be fully retired and sent back home. They located our ASV in a vehicle graveyard in Afghanistan, used and discarded by the Afghan National Army. The actual vehicle I drove in the war now sits out in front of the military police headquarters at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, honoring the 49 ASV teams operating in Iraq at the beginning of the war and standing as a testament to the ingenuity and maneuverability of the U.S. Army Military Police Corps. Although this was a time ripe with history, there were also tragedies to be uncovered at every turn. On May 13, 2003, while responding to a threat of insurgent activity south of Baghdad, my team discovered a courthouse used primarily by Saddam Hussein's son, Uday and Kusay. An informant told us that we had missed them by only a matter of 40 minutes. What we found that day was more harrowing than anything we could have ever imagined. As we began carrying arms full of documents and intelligence out of this torture house, our translator was perched on the back of a trailer going through the documents before we turned them over to the intelligence division. On about my 14th load of documents, the interpreter asked me, what I knew about mass graves. He had found a coordinate located in a city of al Madai, and we agreed to check it out after we were done. When we got close to the coordinates, we saw a field with about a dozen Iraqi nationals, mainly older and younger women, digging with their hands, going from grave to grave, trying to uncover something that they thought was lost forever. As we watched in anguish for a few minutes, I retrieved my entrenching tool from my rucksack, unfolded it, and gave it to an elderly lady to use. I know we couldn't dig ourselves in order to preserve the criminal evidence of these atrocities, so I mimicked the motion of using a shovel in the air, hoping that she would understand. She would only use it to scrape the little mounds of dirt away from the hole that she continued to make with her worn, cracked fingers. It felt as though she was punishing herself for something. We did the only thing we could think of. We positioned our vehicle headlights towards the graves and we stood watch as families continued to dig throughout the night. Upwards of 3,000 graves were uncovered in al -Madai. It is the largest mass grave site found believed to contain mainly Iraqi Shia Muslims. In 2007, the Iraqi Council of Ministers designated the 16th of May as the National Day of Mass Graves to draw attention to the fate of the individuals who were killed and disappeared during decades of conflict and human rights abuse and buried in mass graves. Iraqi authorities estimated that between 250,000 to 1 million people had gone missing in Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. Another tragedy unfolded before our eyes on Memorial Day 20 years ago. 
On May 26, 2003, the first recorded U.S. casualty from an improvised explosive device in the Iraq War occurred when a Cav Scout Humvee exploded on a main supply route west of Baghdad, taking the life of Army Private First Class Jeremiah Smith. I was driving in the Humvee directly behind Jeremiah's when the detonation occurred. It looked as though the vehicle had been plucked from obscurity and slammed back down to the ground with the force of a thousand suns. As we pulled Jeremiah out of the vehicle and began to provide aid, an unholy tattoo of gunfire began to ring out. I'll never forget how we took turns laying over Jeremiah, protecting him from small arms fire that clinged close, as if the whole issue of the entire struggle depended on him alone. Within minutes of the firefight dying out, the ammunition in his Humvee began to cook off, making the situation more deadly. The heat of battle will shake you to your core. Seconds after the fear of dying leaves your veins, everything begins to slow down and even out. I believe it is in that moment that we truly live or die, and sometimes a miracle can happen. As the six foot five, 270 pound medic made his way to us, I watched as a large projectile round left the side of the burning Humvee and hit him center mass in his chest. As he looked back between me and God, he fell backwards. I made my way to him. I could see the round went through the first two layers of fabric and Velcro on the plated interceptor vest that we wore. And as I lifted the second layer, there was nothing, not a smudge, not a scratch, not a blemish. The laws of physics did not apply in that space and time. To be honest, the medic didn't even believe me. We used these miracles to our advantage. As I made my way back to Jeremiah, his pulse was weak and steady. At that moment, we formed a bond that can only be forged in the crucible of battle. The response to this tragedy was immediate. We were able to clear a landing zone for a medevac helicopter with hopes he would make it home safe. Later that evening, we were notified that Jeremiah had passed while in transport. There are some things that we do not have answers to, like how can a miracle happen so close and somebody still has to die? We lift up Jeremiah Smith's memory on this solemn day and honor his sacrifice that was so costly laid at the altar of freedom. At the time, the Army wasn't even sure what to call the explosion that killed Jeremiah. The Defense Department inadvertently applied an oxymoron saying he was hit by an unexploded ordnance. Officials couldn't possibly know at the time that this weapon, what would come to be called in military terms as an improvised explosive device, would be the most destructive of two wars. As we moved from a liberation coalition to an allied coalition, our primary responsibility became to establish a legitimate law enforcement within Iraq. Almost three months after Jeremiah's death, I too would become the casualty by the vicious effects of an IED. In the midnight hours of August 21st, 2003, my team was ambushed while training a group of Iraqi police officers on walking patrol in Abu Ghraib. A 120 millimeter mortar was placed underneath a fuel tanker and was remotely detonated as we walked by. The initial blast took out the power grid so it was dark, and within the first 30 seconds of the fight, I had sustained an explosion blast to my right hand, a shrapnel wound to my right shoulder tearing out my rotator cuff, and a gunshot wound to my right leg. And yet, danger was still close. As I began to grab for my knife, I heard, heard footsteps rushing towards me, and something told me they weren't friendly. The insurgent's breath was labored from running up to me, so I was able to gauge his proximity to me in the darkness. He hung to my right, making it difficult for me to reach him with my left arm. I could feel the tension on my blade as it cut through his skin. I could also hear the wafts of his blade as it cut through the air. As his knife cut down on my arm, cutting off the ID band attached to it, I understood what he was trying to get at. Confirmation that he had successfully attacked U.S. soldiers. As I made my way to the first soldier I could see, it was my lieutenant. He was severely concussed but stable. I remember making the Mayday call on the radio asking for an extraction team. 
The voice on the other end of the radio was calm, and he asked if an air medevac was possible. It was then that I remembered everything it took when Jeremiah was medevaced, and I knew we didn't have it in us, and it wasn't safe. I asked for two Humvees, light carry, just a gunner and a driver, and the voice came back less calm, saying, you know what that means, right? I knew. It didn't need to be said. The only evacuation route was through the market, a small road littered with debris, canopies, and little shops on both sides, without much give on either shoulder of the road, a perfect place for death to hide as it followed us in the shadows of the night. By the time the Humvees arrived and we mounted up, 15 minutes have, had elapsed from the time of the explosion. Within that time, all five members of my team had either been shot or hit with shrapnel. The Iraqi police officer that was walking next to me was killed instantly during the explosion. And we knew it would only get worse as we headed towards the evacuation route through the market. There was a guy who worked in security in the Abu Ghraib market at night. He would diligently stand guard and blow a whistle every 10 to 15 seconds to let people know he was there and everything was safe. It was annoying the first few nights, but it became something that we tuned into. As we approached, we stayed quiet, hoping to hear his whistles. And when we didn't, we knew that it only meant trouble. As the Humvee began to increase its speed, I knew what was happening. We were hoping to outrun all the IEDs that likely lined the road. On the way, we dodged two more IEDs and later found a third, more deadly IED that never detonated. When we pulled up to the Combat Army Surgical Hospital, a total of 40 minutes had gone by since the first explosion. As I stepped out of the Humvee, my broken body fell to the ground for the last time on foreign soil. After going through all that, after waking up from my first surgery while still in Iraq, I was surrounded by the guys who were with me that night. We were banged up pretty good, but we were still alive. I didn't fully understand the extent of my injuries at the time. I remember making them promise not to fill my spot on the team. They sheepishly agreed knowing it was going to be a promise that they would have to break. I spent the next year and a half at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital undergoing 12 extensive surgeries to my right hand and right shoulder, ushering newly wounded soldiers around the grounds to get familiar, as others had done with me when I first arrived there. Some of them I would know. On October 26, 2003, Army Private First Class Rachel Bosfeld was killed in a mortar attack outside the Abu Ghraib police station. She was the fourth female to be killed in the Iraq war, and she was a part of my team. I believe Memorial Day serves as a revival, a renewal to our commitment to the values that define us as a nation. It's important to hear these heavy stories such as these, as they serve as testimonies to the great sacrifices we have made as a nation. It is a time to recommit ourselves to the work we are engaged in, whether it be the military, public service, education, or any other field where we can make a positive impact. It is a time to reflect on the sacrifices of our fallen heroes and to ensure that their legacy lives on in our actions. Strengthened by their courage, hardened by their duty, and borne by their bravery, let us honor the service members who fought and died by upholding the values they held dear and by cherishing the freedoms they secured for us. May their courage and sacrifice inspire us to be better to be stronger and to stand united as one nation, indivisible, under the banner of liberty. Thank you all, and may God continue to watch over the service members who stand on the front lines of liberty.